Hello, I am Margaret Adele, and welcome to episode five of the best and worst of indie books. And this one has been a long time in coming. I actually read both of these books within a pretty short time period of each other um, for the Book Junkie Trials in, what was that, July? So <laughs> a lot of the names I'm a little bit iffy on, um, but I'll try to give my thoughts as best as possible. And as usual, we are starting with the worst and ending with the best because we always want to end on a high note. And for this episode, my worst also kind of gives a, a discussion and that is uh, how much proselytizing in a book is too much. And the book in question is Heritage by D.E. Morris. This is a faith-based fantasy all about a young queen who is new to her throne and must rally these isles of Celtic mythical creatures to fight against this evil king that wants to take them over. Now, I don't usually skim read books. I don't listen to audiobooks on two times speed. I like to savor the stories as I read them. I skimmed the crap out of this book. I had to quote-unquote had to read it for the readathon. There were rules and you had to read uh, your TBR that you picked. You couldn't switch and you had to read them in order to get your team points. So like I didn't like no one was holding like a gun to my head but like I wanted to get my team points but I so regretted picking this for my TBR even though it's been on my Kindle or was it wasn't on my Nook. One of those for forever. I Originally, when we started out, it had just like the standard issues with a lot of shorter indie published novels and that it moved too fast and the protagonist was too protagonist -y. And what I mean by that is um, when you actually sat down and asked, why is the protagonist being the one to do this specific thing? There wasn't a good IRL or in that world answer it was because she's the protagonist um her name is ashlyn she's the queen and she has these magical dragony powers uh, she transforms into a dragon and she is sent at the beginning of the book to kill this evil king basically because he wants to kill all them and when i first read about that i was like oh it must be something about her her magicy powers that that means that she's the only one that can do that well no it was assassination by poison. So then my next quote was, why would you send the queen, the queen who doesn't have heirs or any other family members, like there's no one else to take up this, this throne if she's not there. Why would you send her? Like, she's too, like, if, if her special powers aren't needed, send some other rando. And then her sister, who's the princess and is going to be in line for this other kingdom, is also there. And it's like, why are you risking that much? Like, there's no feasible reason in the real world why the queen should have been the one to do that. It should have been someone else. But she's the protagonist. So she's very protagonist-y, doing things that don't make sense in that world because she's the protagonist of the story. But, okay, whatever. So the king is, is killed, and this is fairly early on, like, in the first chapter, so it's not really a spoiler. And his evil son takes up the reins, and evil son has a sister who's not as evil. It's kind of a children of blood and bone setup. And like that, sister decides that she wants to default to the good guy side and ends up running away with Ashlyn. Like that. I mean, like, was accepted, moved on, like, within a couple chapters. And that was his whole book. Everything moved so fast. Big, gigantic things that should have taken time and effort uh, moved that fast. And again... You had all of these kings and queens that were doing things that kings and queens shouldn't do. Like, they were not even, like, leading the charge. Like, they were in the battle. They were, like, hands-on doing all these things. And it's like, why? Why are you... Half of you don't have heirs. Half of you are, like, already on, on uneasy terms because you're new to the throne. Like, why are you putting your lives on the line for this? Why don't we have soldier characters? Because they all have armies. Uh, so that was just kind of like little annoying things that um, I more or less could have gotten past. The big thing that I just struggled with and disliked so much was the heavy-handed preachiness of the faith aspects. Now, I am not against having faith aspects in a story. I've read another book since then that had faith aspects and rated that five stars. The issue with this was, is that, again, it made no sense, and it seemed purely in there in an attempt to convert the reader. In this world, there is a God character called the Giver, and a Jesus character called the Deliverer. 
Ashlyn was raised in the ways of the giver. Her parents believe in the giver and the deliverer. She is a grown woman, more or less. I think she's supposed to be like late teens, early 20s. And yet somehow has magically never heard of the deliverer. Like she, again, she was raised by parents who believe in it. She was, they were her adopted parents from another kingdom, but like still allies with the kingdom she now rules. There was no reason for her not to know who this Jesus character was. And it made no sense to me why she gets so confused about this. Like you were literally raised in this culture. This would be like, again, someone raised in like a conservative Christian household, not knowing who Jesus was. It made no sense. But then halfway through the story, her love interest is finally the one to explain who the deliverer is. And I am not joking. It is like half a chapter and it is a beat for beat retelling of the cruise and fishing story. Like they like change like a little bit of the names, but like we're talking like, you know, the, I forget who the Pontius Pilate character was washing his hands a bit. Like we're talking all of it. Every aspect of the original story beat for beat was retold. Not shown, like there wasn't like like a crucifixion in the story. Like this character just tells her about it and she converts somehow. She was already in that belief system. So like the only real like comparison I can make was like she was Orthodox Jew and now she's Messianic. Like <laughs> I'm like, this makes no sense. Why is she converting to Christianity when she was already raised in it? And why was she raised by these people who told her all about everything else except this aspect and the only way it made sense for me to think about it, the only possible reason I could think for why this random like half a chapter monologue to be in there was because the reader was supposed to read that and connect with that and it was straight proselytizing like it wasn't it wasn't a I am a Christian and I am an author therefore my beliefs go into my uh writing it was straight up i'm gonna take part and parcel the entirety of the crucifixion story put it in this book <laughs> i literally was, once i realized what was happening i'm like yep i've heard this go on and the ending was whatever it was all whatever and it just aggravated me and it made me so nervous when i actually went to read the other um faith-based book i had for review now, fortunately, that one was a lot better, and that one was more of a author is a Christian, and therefore their beliefs come in. They weren't, she wasn't trying to actively convert anyone through a fantasy story. And that's just, maybe this is more of a discussion, is that, you know, how much of, of belief systems in books should just be a representation of the author's beliefs, and should books be used in an attempt to proselytize? And I fall very much on the, no, they should not be. Um, you should not be trying to convert people, especially when this book was not uh, originally shown to be faith-based, which was also a little bit unnerving for me. Like, that feels kind of shady. If you're going to literally have a beat-for-beat -beat retelling of the crucifixion, you can advertise that as faith-based. That's straight faith-based. Um, or whatever the, the literary terminology we're using that is. What's inspiri inspir inspiring? Inspiring? Inspirational? Whatever terminology you want to use. It was that. But then, <laughs> I gotta move on to the next one because I've already been talking for nearly 10 minutes about the one I disliked. The one I liked, I loved. I have already recommended this book in another video to my friend Brody from A2 Brody. They are already as obsessed with this book as I am and me, them, and another booktuber are already planning on doing a buddy read of the second book because we're that excited for it, and that is Our Bloody Pearl by D.N. Bryn. This was a steampunk, super diverse pirate story. Our main character is a siren called Pearl, and their uh, species is functionally, I don't know if you'd say non-binary or genderqueer, like uh, the way they explain it is they basically can change the bits based on what's needed for mating and, and creating the next generation. So they functionally have no set gender. Um, and I loved that aspect. And uh, Pearl always feels like something other. And in a lot of books where you have a main character that is another non-human entity, a lot of times by the end of the story, they'll end up feeling too human, like, you know, dragons that, that end up just thinking exactly like humans. Pearl always felt different. Uh, they never spoke English. They always spoke in this kind of siren tongue and uh, kind of managed to create a language through hand gestures to to interact. Uh, but 
Pearl was originally captured by an evil pirate captain and tortured and then saved by this other pirate captain and she's not she they coding all sirens as female gotta get they gotta get that out of the brain um they don't trust uh this new pirate captain but this new pirate captain Dijon is much kinder and he's the one that figures out that sirens are more than what they've always been portrayed to be there's an ff romance uh between one of my favorite steampunk tropes and characters which is the short and spunky mechanic uh marielle she's i love her she's it's just one of my favorite tropes and she is the uh cinnamon roll the soft girl tm to uh simone who is dijon's uh first mate and is much more tough so it's it's much more of that um Hufflepuff Slytherin type of of matchup which I love and it's an FF romance uh there is also a lot of representation for um disability Pearl as a result of their torture uh loses most of the use of their tail and as a result struggles to swim and and they're like how can I be a siren if if I can't swim and another character and I don't want to spoil anything ends up with a body altering injury and so there's a lot of undercurrents of becoming disabled later in life and and how do you deal with it how do you handle it and what changes and, and how your mind changes and how you have to see things in a different way and I loved that aspect a lot there's found family um pearl by nature of not being able to swim correctly basically loses their pod their siren pod and must essentially live alone or find a new pod and these humans start becoming their pod and so there's found family aspect there are some fantastically gritty like being out in the ocean in a storm fighting scenes that i love i mean you can't have a pirate story without like a really big fight on a boat in a storm like it doesn't count <laughs> there's not one of those and there is um there also and again i don't want to spoil anything but by the end of the story um with some other characters or these two characters that end up together um you find out that there's asexual rep uh basically these two characters are like uh, fyi i don't really like feel that way about anyone like i love you but like nothing's happening they're like oh no ch it's chill it's fine i don't i don't feel that either so <laughs> i love that aspect and just in general the story with all of the you know swashbuckling and the high stakes and what could have been such a standard romance premise of oh look there's this new pirate captain but he's the good one and therefore like it was taken so differently than even what i was expecting and i was already interested in that concept but it, it, it nothing felt forced in the diversity and i know the whole concept of forced diversity is shady at best but everything had a point and from you know pearl being non-binary gender queer whatever terminology whatever way we want to classify it um had a point in the story and the asexual representation thankfully had a point in the story because it resolved something that i was a little bit nervous about um and it it didn't feel like oh here's a story oh and we sprinkled this up on top like it was so ingrained into the story not that like oh well, you need to justify why this character is, is gay or whatever like not that aspect but it definitely felt like dn brand went into the story knowing pearl's going to be non-binary these characters are going to be asexual this is going to be disability rap this is like it felt cooked in as opposed to sprinkled on top for like marketing purposes and like I said, I suggested this to Brody, um, partially because they love, uh, marine and scary stuff and partially because they're non-binary. Um, that first episode of recommending indie books to booktubers is all based on NB booktubers. Um, I'll have that link down below, but I was super excited to have a book with a book, a book with an NB protagonist to suggest to an NB booktuber. Um, and I just love this one so much. I have been bugging <laughs> Dian Brynn over uh, what the next one is going to be. And I know she's editing it. And I know like what the initials of the title are. I don't know the title yet, but I know what the initials of it are because I've been stalking her on Twitter because I want the next one so badly. And me 
uh, Brody and, oh, I want to say, is it Car I'm going to forget her channel name. Right there. Uh, we are going to be doing a buddy read of the sequel when it comes out because all three of us love it so much. And I'm so happy that there is an indie book that like three different booktubers are super excited to read. Like it's happening, guys. All of my obsessive posting videos of indie stuff is actually having an effect and other booktubers are reading indie books and I'm not going to stop here. We're going to keep going hardcore. Uh, <laughs> but I loved this book so much. Uh, it was such a fun pirate story with so much diversity that all felt very cooked in and very purposeful. And I loved it so much. I finished it so fast. Um, and it was really nice that I think, did that come, was it right before or right after uh, Heritage by D.E. Morris, where it was like, I had such a high and a low in such a short time. So the Book Junkie Trials was weird, um, but I'm glad I got to read these. It might be a little bit before I get to the next episode in this series, only because, again, most of my indie books lately have been for review. <laughs> so hopefully I'll get another one of these out, at least a couple more by the end of the year. Fingers crossed. Um, but thank you so much for watching. This video has gone on for a little long, so I'm going to wrap it up. If you have ever read either of these books, uh, let me know. How do you feel about proselytizing or, or faith-based books that lay out the faith that bluntly. Uh, let me know. Uh, let me know if you've ever read another book similar to Our Bloody Pearl uh, with a nine binary protagonist. I am always looking for more diverse reads. And with nothing else to say, I hope you have a wonderful day and a marvelous tomorrow.